following is a Comfortably Zoned Radio Network production. All right, people. We're here for another Duke's Court tonight. On one hand, we have Chris, the Onion King Fletcher. We have, and I don't know what this means, but I like it, Gary Zod Kim. You know what Zod means? No. No. I, it's here. It's here. And I'm going to be Dave Nessie Finoli. As I think about this, uh, the, the Loch Ness Monster. Or is that Tessie? <laughs> what or is Tessie? Tessie? Zod? Is it Nessie or Tessie? I thought it was... I'm not sure. Nessie, I thought, was the nickname. Uh, Tessie's the, the son of a bitch uh, in Boston in the 1903 series, now that I'm thinking about it. Tessie. No, that's Tessie. That's Tessie. That, that's Tessie, yeah. Uh, Wagner said... Oh, they're real bastards up there in Boston, aren't they? Winning all the championships. It's getting old. It's getting old, it fellas. It's getting old. What do we, what do we got, five, five Red Sox titles now or four? One, two... Uh, Four. Four, seven, 13, yep. Yeah. You got four there. You got six Patriot, uh, one Bruin, one Celtic. But their college sports suck, so that's that's something positive. True. Well, the, Other they college do college. leave the league in racism, too, so they've got that going for them. They do. They yes, do. They do. You know? Yes, they do. And they talk funnier than we do. Well, that's the thing. They have good fish, though. Although, uh, Gary, we chose not to honor any Boston food in uh, in our Super Bowl party this year. Did you? Good. Yeah, good. You know, we were hoping that throw some bad karma down, but it, it apparently didn't. Did you have some Los Angeles food? We did. We did. Tacos or we something? Had, uh, fish tacos? We had, uh, my son made Korean barbecue. Oh, yeah, that's, a, barbecue. that's in L.A., yeah. Yep. yep. You know. You know, I did uh, I did Korean egg rolls, and uh, you know, uh, uh, California uh, pulled pork, mm -hmm. and uh, you know that, that California pit roast, which I know uh, it probably was a favorite of yours when you lived out there, Fletch. Oh, it was, it was. I I, I, did, I definitely ate very well out there. Yeah, should have mailed some to Goff, I think. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll tell you what, that performance reminded me of Big Ben's Super Bowl Forty performance, which I consider one of the worst in Super in modern Super Bowl history. Uh, after the Mel Blunt rule came into effect, um, and let me tell you, let me tell you, gentlemen, people say it was boring. People say it was dull. The more I thought about it, the more I was just amazed at the coaching job um, Belichick did amazed at how he had that defense set up um, to pretty much stop what had been the league's, uh, certainly the best rushing attack and the best offense. Um, it, you never really felt uh, until the one drive that they had a chance to score. I never felt they had a chance to score um, a, a touchdown the whole game. I the defense, I, when was the last time you saw, especially a Super Bowl, where one defense was that dominant? It, it reminded you of, of the Super Bowl Nine Steeler defense, which, I mean, the only way you felt the Vikings were going to score that day was was the way they did on a block punt. Yep. Um, I mean, Jonathan Jones, Stephen Gilmore, Jason McCarthy, who the hell are these guys? And yet they did one of the great defensive jobs on this, uh, on Goff, on um, uh, an offensive line, which formerly I thought was, you know, challenging the Steelers, if not uh, challenging, maybe the better, uh, the best uh, um, offensive line in the league. They looked horrible. They, they looked like a Division II college team um, playing there. And, I, I mean, I, how are you not covering Edelman? How is, Edelman is like your only passing um, um, threat, and he was wide open all day. I, I just, I, I thought that uh, um, he uh, completely out uh, uh, was the dominant coach. I mean, I've always claimed over the last few years he's 
best coach I ever saw, but this takes it to a new level. Um, I, I was just absolutely thoroughly amazed at what he did. And the rushing game, which, I mean, where it had been all year. Uh, Sony Michael uh, had, had just uh, uh, done a tremendous job the whole playoff. I mean, and ripping long runs, ripping runs when it looked like, uh, I mean, they absolutely needed it. Where was the, the Ram interior defense? Why was Aaron Donald on the friggin' bench for, for so many plays? I mean, it, it just, on one end, you had one of the stupidest coach Super Bowls I've ever seen, and on the other end, he was a genius. Belichick was a genius this day. Um, so while many may say that, that you know, it was a boring game, blah, 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 I like a good defensive battle. This was a defensive battle. This wasn't, this wasn't Jared Goff screwing up and Tom Brady screwing up. Um, I mean, Brady let him up and down the field. I mean, they, they couldn't finish it, that's for sure, and he didn't play his best game. But Goff was just awful, and it was a defense that made him awful. I mean, Gurley, was he hurt? What was the problem? C.J. Anderson yeah. um, just looked horrendous. I, I mean, this was this, this, to me, was his crowning achievement in what has been just a phenomenal career. And I, I, I'm not a... Uh, Patriot fan by any stretch, but I got to tell you, I, I, you know, I have to applaud what he did here, and I, I have to applaud how that defense just adjusted and made um, Los Angeles 62 yards rushing for Gurley and Anderson. I mean, that, that's yeah. just that's horrendous. Yeah. Um, Fletch, I was sitting next to you, and I, I I've got to assume you were just as uh, as amazed at it, Dave. I- Belichick did something I had never seen before. He employed a 6-1-4 defense. He had one linebacker in there. Yeah. And the reason was, you know, L.A. is a running team. They get the running game going, and then they work off the play action, and that's how they beat you. So by having six guys in the box like that, he was disrupting all the running lanes. They couldn't run. Because they couldn't run, they had no play, play action passing game, and – with those, he played his defensive backs in the corner uh, layout, so he had four guys stretched across there. He took away the slants. He took away the short passes. It was just an absolutely masterful defensive plan. And then the other thing he did is he had his guys on, on third down, on passing downs. They were all standing up. They were using that, I guess they call that their amoeba defense. The Rams line didn't know who was coming from where. Yep. Um, and they did not make any kind of adjustments. I mean, they, they what they probably should have done is they probably should have gone, brought another back in or brought it, go three tight ends most of the time and then try to disrupt that, but they never made the adjustments. No. But it was just a truly masterful defensive plan. And I, I've i never seen a seven a, a 6 one four like that before. No. Never seen that defense ever. No. No. It, it was... I, I just so much respect for what, what, what they pulled off there. And you're right. I mean, the arrogance of not thinking you had to make any adjustments because they didn't make any adjustments. Well, whether it was the arrogance that, that thought they could come back or whether it was just he was so dumbfounded that he didn't know what to do, which I hope it wasn't that. And Goss, Goss uh, receivers didn't make plays for him either. I mean, there, there are a couple plays that could have been made that, that just weren't made. So, yeah, it was it was a bad – quarterback performance, but a lot of that was dictated by that defense. And there, yeah. there had to have been something wrong with Gurley. He's not been, he hadn't been the same for the past three weeks or so. So I don't know. It was uh, it was really I, – I, I kept thinking to myself, I, I would have loved to have seen that New Orleans matchup against that defense because you know that they would have made the adjustments. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe it was just uh, – uh, the, the youthfulness of uh, the coaching. Um, I, I, I just, I was dumbfounded. I was absolutely jaw open, dumbfounded how no adjustments ha- had been made there. But what did, what did you think of it, Gary? I mean, I, I, I don't really have much to add. I mean, I, I think it was clear to me that late in the season, Gurley was not the same. Um, they relied on him pretty heavy. He's kind of a punishing runner. You know, he's not a guy that really avoids a lot of contact. So he wasn't the same, but that's not an excuse. 
Uh, Anderson couldn't do anything either. Um, totally agree with you guys. It wasn't all Goff's fault. I think McVay looked at times confused and baffled. So the offensive line, for the reasons you guys both described, let you describe. Didn't know who was coming from where. And I guess that play, I guess Gurley had been so good between the tackles or even on the outside. And they'd been running the ball so thoroughly down people's throats most of the season. that I don't think McVay was necessarily cocky, but I don't think he'd ever been put in a position where he was totally confused like that. There, there was a game where when Ryan was here and his big mouth and the Eagles were killing everybody, and they played the Bears in that fog game. And they had Cunningham completely baffled. That's what it felt like to me. Like the ball's going nowhere near receivers and ball's getting thrown low and offensive line not know how to adjust. And, and honestly, I just think he was completely unprepared for some change. And I don't know. I'm not as much of a football knowledgeable as you guys, but it was pretty obvious early on they weren't going to be able to run the ball and get that play action. So, again, I don't understand why. Spread the field a little bit. A little bit of short passes. That amoeba defense can't really do much about that. Get a little momentum going, which the Rams never got. And you're right about the Donald thing. I, I don't understand that at all. You never know how banged up these guys are. But, I mean, these guys just in the NFL just have a tendency to outthink themselves. You know, like what the hell sense does it make to have a guy like that not on the field that much in a 3-3 game? Yeah. Like, I mean, he, just, he could hit somebody and cause a fumble in the game changes. Now, we don't know if there was a physical issue, and they don't like to release that even after the game's over in the NFL. But, but I mean, you know, Belichick never won a Super Bowl this way. I mean, so, you know, to the legacy, I mean, he's, to me, he's hard to stand. You know, he's kind of like Reed without the completely obnoxious one-word answers. But you know, I can't stand him. Uh, you know, Brady gets on my nerves, too. It's not because they're winning. You know, too much about, you know, the actress wife or – model wife and all this kind of stuff who cares i mean but the fact of the matter is okay is like okay let, let me interrupt you there gary if you have the chance and i know i'm not saying now i'm not saying i'm not putting a curse on your marriage but if you're tom brady with with giselle yeah are you are you not going to brag about that is that not in a guy i don't think he does it i'm just tired of the media making a big he doesn't actually do it to tell you the truth i mean it's more the media watching it's like it's like watching some of these nba guys every time they go to the Okay, let me put it this way. You have a buddy who marries a model. You want to live vicariously through him, correct? Uh, probably, yeah. So The yeah, media is living vicariously through Tom Brady. I think so. I think so. I think you're right about I mean, that. I mean, but you're I mean, looking at a, a guy like, let's let's say Bob Smizek, uh, who, you know, you can all envision. This is Bob Smizek, if he was still reporting, it would be his opportunity to live vicariously through Tom Brady. <laughs> That's a fair statement. So. I mean, I just mean, it's, you know, they, they, the media coverage of all this stuff kind of makes them hard to like. But the guy, you know, and when the game was on the line, he made the plays. He went four for four on the key drive. Yeah. You know, and, uh, you know, I think uh, the part that I think that really was, was, was never talked about during this, this Patriots title was the fact that their offensive line played extremely well all during yeah. the late regular season and the postseason. They were pretty much vilified earlier in the year. And the running game's a lot better. I mean, you never know who, you know, these guys, nobody knows who they are, but they yeah. get in that system. And, you know, I mean, Michael was really, I mean, I thought Michael should have probably been the MVP, to tell you the truth. You know, Edelman caught no, the ball he, because he, Michael was running the ball so well, you know, and they were churning up some clock to finish the tight, low-scoring game out, you know. And so, especially uh, down the stretch when, yeah. I mean, you need yeah. a stop to keep in the game. Right, and he, and he, not just him, the running game takes them all, but, that offensive line, even still, even in some of the stuff afterwards that I heard or saw, even on you know, regular media, they never gave that offensive line a lot of credit. I mean, no. and, and not so much in this game. You know, Brady didn't have the greatest game either, but he made the plays again when the game's on the line. And the running game kind of chewed up the clock and got him the, the win in a tight game. So I think McVay's stock hasn't really fallen precipitously, but it fell a little bit. No. You know? no. And I mean, um, it should. Yeah. And I think Belichick's stock probably went up. He's already going to Canton. So is Brady. Probably some of that front office ought to, too. And uh, it just added to it. And, uh, I mean, I wasn't necessarily bothered so much by the low score either. I mean, it was better than some of the other ones. NFL's become a little bit of tag football. This reminded me a little bit of the game where it was Harrison had the big game. I think that was against the Rams, too. 
where they just kind of bludgeoned the Rams receivers and they changed the rules. But, you know, it was the same kind of game. Like, I mean, the offense, the, the high-powered offense, it was Warner, I think, then, but the high-powered offense coming here couldn't do anything. you got to respect that. So, um, yeah. you know, I don't have a lot to add to what you guys are saying. I, I do think, you know, that 6-1-4 and jam in the box, I think they knew Gurley was compromised watching the film. They were prepared for it. McVay had no answer, and he needed to get an answer for a fairly, almost a rookie quarterback in a big game and all that media attention against the defense that was really designed to, to confuse. McVay made no adjustments, and, and that's kind of the story of it. And, um, you know, I mean, I think uh, full credit. Full credit got to go to the Patriots. So, you know, the other storyline coming out. I'm sorry, Fletcher. Sorry, Gary. Yeah. I interrupt you. Let's say the, the other uh, story. The other storyline coming out of this is now all of this the support for Edelman to be in the Hall of Fame. And he is, a big, much. he is he is a great postseason player, no question about that. But you know, I, if it's between Heinz Ward and Julian Edelman, I know who I'm putting in first. I agree. Well, and and Julian Edelman, you know, is a great, uh, but so is Gene Tennis. Does Gene Tennis get in the Hall of Fame because he? Was a good World Series player? Not my view. He hit 220 a number of times. I mean, right right now this guy doesn't even have 500 career catches. Mm-hmm. And a Hall of Fame is more, to me, postseason <coughs> enhances your candidacy, but you have to do it in the regular season to make a Hall of Fame. I, I, I just I chuckled. I mean, the guy has a 10.8 uh, uh, yards per catch a- average. I mean, that's that's... That's not Hall of Fame stuff. I mean, I agree. I no, he, but he is he is one of the, the best slot receivers around. No question about that. Without a he's doubt. A good, he, he's a possession receiver, yeah. but I don't think he's not a Hall of Famer. So just let's just stop that ridiculous bullshit talk before it gets too much. Absolutely. I think absolutely. Like, should, should. You guys have been looking at the ESPN Plus site like this whole week. Kellerman's doing nothing but talking about who's the, the, the G-O-A-T or who's the best James Jordan? Why do we got to do this all the time? Why, why can't you just let the games roll and somebody gets a, somebody gets a, uh, a roll going and they have a cons- – if Edelman does this three or four more times and he piles up a lot more catches and stuff like that, I guess you can talk about it. But it just seems yeah. like we've got to find something all the time that's going to Valhalla. You know, I mean, yeah. let the games Although roll. i got to tell you, I found it humorous that Scotty Pippen, he of the um, – playoff game where he, he gave up on his team and stayed on the bench Yep. Um, as, uh, as the goal to come out and, and claim that James isn't in the ballpark with anybody else. I mean, I, I agree that Michael Jordan, in my estimation, is, is the best I've seen. I mean, but, I mean, to put James, uh, almost putting the guy down, I mean, he's a hell of a player. Uh, and he's, he's basically lifted up Cleveland how many years in a row on his on his own. Won a bunch um, of titles too. People forget. Yeah, they can't forget that. I mean, but yeah. I mean, it just so, seems like we always got to do this. We have a Super Bowl game that a guy has a good game. He's had a pretty good career, and yeah, Fletch is right. I mean, he has slot receivers, very effective. Um, yeah. You know, but to that level, I don't see it. I'm sorry, he's, I don't. I don't see it. Not even weird. So not even close. I mean, nope. he's not even in the discussion of he could be a future Hall of Famer. No. That's where I am. You know how he gets in the Hall of Fame, guys? How? Oh. He pays the 20 bucks at the entrance, and he gets in that one. <laughs> That's the way I look at it. Uh, I Just thought you were going to say he, he, he gets elected uh, on a veterans committee with Tony La Russa heading the charge. <laughs> To me, it's got to be long-term, sustained, regular season, postseason enhances. Couldn't agree more, Dave. But long-term, sustained statistics in a certain range. Uh, and yes, if postseason they're good, it can add to it. He fits very few of those bills, other than maybe some postseason good games. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I'm sorry, I, I don't see it. So, yeah. never near the most dominant receiver in the game. Never no. near. So, no. it's a good receiver. And, and good receiver, right? You know, very good offense. Although very well conceived offense. You know, although I'll tell you the the 
controversy over, which is just stupid. You know, should he have been able to play? Baseball doesn't allow their players to play in the postseason who have been uh, suspended on on uh, PED. Well, that's not the rule in the NFL. It, it's a, it's a right. stupid discussion, to say the least. I'm, I'm not even sure it's a, it's a smart thing to do for baseball. I mean, you, you've suspended the guy 80 games. Why the hell does he have to stay out the, the postseason, too? But I, I just thought that was one of the most asinine uh, controversies and, and just shows on Super Bowl week people have too much to talk about. Too much time focused on it. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Yep. I mean, Roll is the guy suspended for his spent his time suspended and I have no problem with him playing. I mean they're tested now. So I, I don't know, do they test those guys more? They probably do. Yeah. I don't know if the players association agreement, but I mean once you've done it once you're probably watched. Right. Um, Right. Yeah. Oh, man. And, uh, well, you know, you talk players' association. Is there any? And and you're going to be impressed with this segue, Fletch. Yeah, Is there I'm any more bitter here. players' association than baseball? Good segue. Good segue. Uh, very good segue. Nice. Particularly when you talk about the, what we're going to talk about, their reactions to some of this. Like, I think they got negotiating power. Well, in some of the rules. Tell you what, Manfred who, you know, is my selection as the worst commissioner in, in sport. You know, he, Ooh, he comes that's out. That's a tough one. He, I know, I know. He's, he, is, he is my worst because he, he's, I'm going to call him the Maybelline man because he, he's intent on putting cosmetic changes uh, on the game that will have no chance of doing anything of importance other than changing the game. You know, we've talked about recently, we've come up, okay? You want to have a guy who's only able to pitch or has to pitch to three batters. He's he's talking about the DH in the National League, which, again, I'm not sure how that speeds up the game. Am I more apt to think... You know, if you didn't allow the relief pitchers to warm up a second time when they come in after warming up in the bullpen, that would cut time off. Why Why is the advantage given to the offense where I can pinch hit as many times as I want? Because And, and the pitcher now doesn't have to. I, I like, personally, the righty-lefty matchups. And, you know, you're going to waste a pitcher now because the, the – uh, um, because you got a lefty and a righty. Put the lefty in, then you pull the righty in. So you've wasted one of your pitchers. There's nothing wrong with that. Baseball is meant to be a chess match. Um, even bringing up, I know it's only for exhibition games and all-star, but this senseless, got to put a second guy on base in the 11th inning so we don't go too far. This is not baseball. Midget stuff, midget ball stuff. Anybody who wants to, who, who's sitting there and is pissed off because a game is less than or not less than three hours is not a fan of the sport. What you need to do, here's some acceptable things. I mean, I know the DH is inevitably coming, so if we have to take it, we have to take it. Um, and, there, and there is some, as much as I hate the concept of the DH, there is something to be said for a uniform game among both leagues. But what causes major league games to be long is guys stepping out of the box constantly after every pitch, picking at themselves, readjusting their gloves. Every pitch this happens, the pitcher has to step off the rubber and has to, you know, re, uh, refocus himself. This is the difference why a minor league game lasts less than a major league game. You don't need to make the game different. You don't need to make shifts illegal. You don't need to do all this other, pardon my language, bullshit that he's doing to change the game just to make some people who don't actually love the game of baseball happy. If you want to make it a shorter game, you get in the box. If you step out of the box, it's a strike. Pitcher, you step off the rubber, it's a ball. Plain and simple. That speed up the game. You want to speed up the relievers? 
don't let them warm up a second time. There's no need to let them warm up a second time. I, I don't care. The argument is, well, he has to get used to the catcher. Bullshit. Baloney. You know, right. exactly. Baloney. You, you, don't, you don't let them warm up. And if you, you're concerned about so many pitchers, this I would have no problem with. Limit the amount of pitchers you can carry to 10. That would limit the amount of relievers you can use, correct? Yep. 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 I mean, I'd have no problem with that. You're not changing the game. That way too. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So then that becomes a challenge. Well, I, I can't really, you know, do the righty-lefty thing here. So, you know, that, that puts a challenge into his thought process. I mean, 12, 13 pitchers in a game uh, on a roster to me is, I mean, that, that's a wasted uh, thing. Make a limit like that. But I, I am in no way, shape, and form. I thought about it. Originally, I thought, eh, I'd probably have no problem with the three-pitcher thing. But the more I think about it, the more I don't like it. The more I don't like changing the game because you think that's going to speed it up. The, 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 the time aspect of these changes he's proposing is nothing more than he's a little little cosmetic guy. He's going he's gonna to spray uh, the uh, fragrances on, on you, Fletch and Gary, as you walk in the store. You know, that's what Manfred is. He's, he's a little cosmetic guy. These are, these are stupid changes. Have some balls. Come at these guys. Look, this is what we're going to do. You step out of the box, it's a strike. And, or it's a strike. And the same thing with pitchers. You, you would end that. You would speed up the game that way. Um, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, just getting a little off subject here, something I would also do if I'm the players and I'm pissed off, I don't, I don't care about adding a DH to the league. What you need to do is you need to come up with a, with, with a floor salary cap. You need to spend $120 million. Right. I mean, it's, uh, stop with the I'll punish you and, and I'll fine you and I'll, I'll, you know, the fine doesn't make him spend more money on the team. Making him spend $120 million makes him spend more money on the team. And that would get the guys like nutting out of the, out of the game if they're that interested in, in making a buck. That's how you that's how you make the game more competitive. Not this other bullshit he was talking about with uh, you know doing the the lottery pick in, in in the draft, which I'm not a huge fan of. Just make them spend the money. You know, yeah. I mean, make them spend the money. That's what the NBA does. Uh, Got to have a minimum. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yep, uh, Gary. I mean, I, you know, I don't think there. I, I think I think there's a couple other things here that are never discussed and continues to amaze me. And I'm going to sound like a broken record, but I think the pitch clock. I like the idea. You know, uh, Verducci, who I don't like, but he wrote something like the average pitch last year time was 24 seconds. So they're going to speed up by four seconds. Players are going to bitch. I don't care. I, I like the clock, but I, with the clock, I would combine exactly what you said, Dave. Can't get out of box. If you get out of box and go over 20 seconds, it's a strike. And they're going to, you know, some of these clowns, Machado especially, looking at themselves all the time, they're going to argue with everything. I don't care. We're calling it. Just like in hockey, you know, everybody hated that you put the stick on somebody's hands, whether you slashed them or not, was a penalty. Everybody in the NHL squawked, oh, the game's awful, Milbury, guys like that. Now it's routine. Same thing in baseball. Two, three years from now, guys, are new. I'm not going to be able to step out. I'm going to be down 0-2 all the time. Yeah. Pitcher, same thing. Screwing around. Looking at the mound, tapping your chest and holding it up to the sky. Baloney. Get in. Get ready to throw. Stay on the mound. You don't deliver in 20 seconds. It's a ball, period. Yeah. It's going to be ugly, a lot of arguments, a lot of pain and suffering in the beginning. But I put the, I put the, the, the pitch clock or batter box clock with, with the fact that you can't step out. But I think that could So what you're up. saying, Gary, is God is not looking down and making the sky strike out to the pitcher. I think with I think I think after five and a third innings in a three three game, in the middle of July, I don't think God's paying attention to it, you know. All so right. and and All honestly, right. I mean, too much of this histrionics because they know the cameras on them. I mean, yeah. speeding it up a little bit would kind of stop some of that. Now the umps have to enforce it, and the right. owners have to reinforce it, which is a big problem in baseball, you know. We, and I think you're right on to digress for a minute about some of my thoughts on some of the rule changes. Manfred is afraid to tangle in a fierce way with anybody, you know, and honestly, I think he represents the owners. He should come out and say, yeah, we got a players association agreement, but I don't care. We got a huge problem. 
we got a 15% drop off. Our games are four hours long. People aren't paying attention. Our ratings are dropping. These guys are carping about the fact that two, which I'm not sure they're generational talents or not, aren't getting paid. Nobody wants them. It's going to get worse. We need to do yeah. some things here. He needs to be a little more confrontational than he's been. I'm sorry. Well, and you're going to have a big war coming up. There's going to be a strike. The, the anyway. players are pissed at the money. Anyway, right. Yeah. So my point is we're going to change the game. We might not be able to deal with some of the economic problems with these salaries and stuff like that. And I have some thoughts on that after we're done with the rules, if you guys think about it. Too. Yeah. The more I think about it, I don't, I don't, I'm not really surprised at what's happening. And there's a lot of reasons for that. But let, let me stay to the rules for a minute, Dave. Uh, the rule changes. I mean, I, I think the pitch clock is a good idea, and I think not getting it out of the box. I'm going to tag on one other thing with it. Dave, I think we've only talked about this on these forums, okay? We're all, we're all getting up there. We've all watched the game for 35 years. I've also talked to some people, like my boss, who's 72, 73. He's watching the game for 60 years. Mm-hmm. Big problem is with the strike zone and the umpiring. The strike zone is too small. Okay, it cannot just be the belt to the knees. Go back to the shoulders to the knees or letters to the knees and call it. It would gross up offense. It would cause more swinging. It wouldn't cause as many standing around. And it wouldn't cause three two counts two times an inning. I mean, I'm sorry. The strike zone is too small. Every count's a deep count. These guys are taken deep into the count to work these pitchers because nobody can go past five innings anymore. Change the strike zone. And I don't want to hear, like you always say, Dave, I don't want to hear Angel Hernandez. Well, that's my strike zone. Well, then you're fired. You're fired. Right. Okay. You don't have the strike zone. The rules have the strike zone. That would juice up the offense, and it would juice up the action, and guys wouldn't just be standing there working a damn count to get the pitch they can drive 500 feet. And it would also cause pitchers to have to pitch more because, you know, guys are going to start timing that 96-mile-an-hour fastball above the belt after a few at-bats. So, I mean, I think that's a big part of this. It's never going to happen, but I said it years ago. When I'd go to Memorial Stadium in Baltimore, it had huge foul territory, all the way down to the foul poles and behind home plate. Oakland, why is Oakland winning now? Yes, they're drafting well, but their pitchers get a couple cheap outs a game if you watch those games. In these new junky band box ballparks, like this piece of junk here, and even PNC a little bit, there's no foul territory. They've got to change that somehow. I mean, I'm tired of listening to the owners. Oh, I don't want to give up my premium seats. Baloney. The game stinks. There's a lot of standing around. There's way too many foul balls and nibbling. They've got to do something about that. There should be minimum. I'm not saying to take away Fenway's uniqueness or Yankee or PNC. You can build your ballpark wherever you want. But Power Alley's got to be a this, I could hit the ball out of the Power Alley here in Philadelphia. It's a joke. What does it do? With that small strike zone, it causes these pitchers, even ones that can really throw the ball, to never really put the ball down the heart of the plate. They don't use the fielders anymore. They're fearful because all their contracts are tied to it. Something's got to be done about that. Move the fences back a little bit, perhaps. Have minimum power alley requirements. And honestly, have minimum foul territory, at least between third and first. I mean, right now, some of these parks, when's the next time you've seen a foul out at some of these new ballparks? Never. Yeah. That adds to the time of this. And honestly, I don't, this fan experience stuff, I mean, you're talking about, you're talking about cutting down, what, two rows in 40,000-seat stadiums? You could still charge the same price. People spend way too much money on this stuff anyway. I don't think it would cause that big of a deal. And honestly, some of these junky power alleys like Yankee Stadium in Philadelphia have caused the game to slow down, period. Yeah. Those things are never talked about by Manfred. It just shows that some of these people don't have any idea what's going on in the game, in my view. Right. You know, DH, I don't love it. Uh, that's a Players Association pushback if you read some of the stuff that's out there. You know, the, it's amazing to me that these guys worry about one slot on a roster. Uh, and when they're carping, you know, like whether it's Bryant or somebody was carping to the press about this. I mean, it's one spot. And right now, it's, it's what? It's 15 spots. I mean, yeah. if that's their pushback, that's pretty lame to fight back against all these rules because they're mad because nobody gave, you know, Machado $30 million when he's not worth it. I mean, right. honestly, if they go to it, I don't really care. I think it's going to go there because it's one way they're going to be able to keep somebody. You know, they're going to argue that it's going to juice up offense, and it might. I hate the rule. I don't think that the strategy is quite as complicated as the National League likes to sell it, but I also don't think it does as much in the American League as they like to sell it. The batting averages in both leagues last year were pretty damn comparable from something I read. It really isn't juicing up offense. And, in fact, 
with the way the game is with these parks and the strike zone and the contracts based upon how many, you know, RBIs you have or home runs you have, I think you put the DH in some of these lineups, particularly lineups that don't have a lot of pop, it's going to slow the game down even further, honestly. In my yeah, it could affect the WFIP uh, or the XFIP or whatever the hell the new uh, new metric of the year is. Yeah, whatever one they come up with, right. But I think we'll see right. that one, and particularly if they go to allow you know the 26-man roster or 28 or whatever and more pitchers, I think we're going to see that because some of these pitchers and their agents and their front offices are going to complain, well, my pitchers are under such strain and all this kind of stuff, so not having to bat – uh, you know, and putting somebody in there to do that, they're going to use that that way. I think, unfortunately, as much as I hate it, I think we're going to see it. Three batter minimum. I mean, I don't have a big problem with it. I think, you know, it, kind of the things you alluded to, Dave, and I've said this for years. I started thinking about this in the late 90s. Some of the games I'd go to in Philadelphia in that home run era and the steroid era, you know, you could clearly see that it was just a delay tactic to be changing pitchers two and three times in an inning so they'd get the extra seven warm-up pitches so they could get to the eighth in a close game or ninth yeah. in a close game. I mean, I'm sorry, you know, these guys have analytics over how many times a guy, like, sneezed or breathed heavy when the ball was an inch off the plate you know, on the outside. They ought to know ahead of time if these situations arise, here's who we're going to go to. So I'm not really as bothered by the three-batter minimum. I think it could speed the game up a little bit, but I think the bigger issue is I'm sorry – manager like this idiot here can't get people warmed up in time and stuff there's no excuse for it if you've been sitting there pouring over statistical sheets all day you should have been prepared for who you were going to bring up if the game was close and Bryce Harper was coming to the plate in the eighth inning I mean I'm sorry I don't want to hear it and and they shouldn't be coming in throwing seven warm-up pitches you change a pitcher two times or three times an inning those seven warm-up pitches add another five ten minutes you know right I mean, the, the, the other change, I think, I'm not even going to talk about the stupid tiebreaker rule. I don't care about the all-star game. Uh, post, uh, pre-season or regular, or, uh, you know, uh, spring training, I don't care. Regular season and postseason, that ought to have no discussion at all in my mind. That's completely ridiculous. This isn't midget ball. Um, no shifts. I would leave that alone. Teams have to adjust to it. I don't want to hear it. Uh, a lot of teams beat the shift. Um, the teams that have some lineup balance. The Brewers, especially last year, showed that. Um, you know, I, I think it's a lot of cosmetic again, and I think it clearly shows that this guy won't battle anybody. And I think he's got to start battling some people on this, and the owners have to support it. But the two simple things that never get discussed are these junky parks and that ridiculously small strike zone. I mean, just count when the games start this year how many times you get to a 3-2 count. And I guarantee you it's probably 33% of the at-bats. That strike zone's no. wider. You got to be hacking. You know, and, I'll tell you what. and I think it would it would speed the game up. So, Fletch, what would you call Manfred? I'd say he's a bit of a busher, but a I still busher. think that Batman Batman is the worst of the of the commissioners in my mind still. But yeah. you know, it's like your Beatles Rolling Stones thing. You know, some people are Beatles yeah. fans, some people are Rolling Stones fans. Yep. But I'm going to take a little different uh, tack on this. I actually like the the thought of the three batter minimum, and I'll tell you why. A lot of times, guys, baseball has has gone from being a nine inning game to a seven inning game because the relievers are so dominant at the end. This may shake some things up. We may see we may see a lot more lead changes late in the games so that we're just not seeing. Mm-hmm. True. For a number of reasons. Uh, the other thing too, I I do like the pitch count, the pitch clock idea because. They're already doing it in Double A. They're doing it in Triple A. You know those leagues have not imploded as as a result of it. So these these pitchers are coming up through the minors. They're going to be used to that. So why not why not just in, in, enforce that? And the same with the batters, Bosch. But you know the key is going to be the enforcement part of it. Uh, the DH, well, you know it, it's ridiculous that since 1973 we've had leagues operating on two different sets of rules. And you know the it's one of the highest paying positions in baseball, so you know that the union is not going to let that go away. So the National League just needs to suck it up and get it in there. I don't like it. I'm not a big fan of it. But can you tell me another sport that has two different leagues who who will be meeting for a championship at the end of the year who play under two different rules? Doesn't happen. It is ridiculous, so, and I would agree true. with you on that. Hundred percent. Don't like it, but but it's it's. Needs to needs to happen. Uh, I I think the other thing we may want to look at 
um, particularly if the umpires are going to continue to be testies, we have the technology now that we can automate ball and strike calls. Let's just do that. If they don't want, if they don't want to agree to enforce the the strike zone as it's written in, you know, the the rule books, um, then there's a problem there. Yep. And that, that's a matter of arrogance and, and an umpires union. You know, these guys have to remember, I'm not I'm not going there to see the umpire. I'm going there to see the players. And and, and if you if you go to the automated strike zone then that that takes a lot out of the argument well if uh, um, if if we don't give in to the umpires they strike and then we have a lesser game all of a sudden that's the biggest complaint was how they handled the plate with the faster pitches you know I, I'm, I, I'm I'm with you I think that is one change that should happen ASAP now the other thing that, that we've seen happen which I like if you notice in some broadcasts you're seeing some of the ads starting a little bit sooner yep, um, yeah. and seeing them more during some of that so-called dead time in there. I mean, yep. One of the things that's going to be difficult for the baseball owners to the stomach is to, to cut down on those, on those commercial breaks. I mean, they're, they're brutal during the postseason. And, and, you know, there's a lot of money on the line there. But if they can do something there where, where they can insert them a little bit earlier and not give up that revenue, I, I think that that's a way to go. Um, I, I also think that the baseball has to look very closely at what it's going to do for the fans in the stadiums, the in-game experience, because one of the, one of the problems is that the, the technology that's there, watching a game at home, you, you get so many different camera angles, you get a lot of different things that you're not getting at the ballpark. So what can you do to make that, that ball game a little bit more special for the people who are actually there? Um, what that what might, suggestions I think, do you think for that? True. Well, I mean, I mean, part of it would, could come through technology, or there, maybe there is a way that, uh, that that they're able to see certain replays that's only shown in the stadiums, or there, there's something that they get that maybe the, that they get access to to actually, you know, what's being said before a game or something like that. But just some way to bring that connection a little bit closer to it. Um, and, and baseball is the other thing. Baseball is, has that, that none of the other sports has is this incredible sense of tradition. Mm-hmm. So uh, let's use that more. Let let let's bring back some of the older players. Let's get them more involved with with the game as itself. So to try to, to to promote that a little bit more. There's a lot of different things that they need to do. Uh, like I said, I I do like the three batter minimum. Um, that I, I think that puts a whole different strategy into it. It's a manager. You got to be a better manager thinking about that. So and you do. Yeah. It certainly would. My my big problem with it is that just to me that gives just more an advantage to the um, to the offensive uh, manager. Yeah. Um, if he's still allowed to to switch as normal. Mhm. Yeah. It's true. But I mean that that's my problem with it. It you know. Um, but you're right. It would add an interesting element. Certainly. It certainly a, would. Well, I, I think one of the problems with the game, too, Dave, that this helps address is the, the number of strikeouts that are up, the balls aren't being put in play. So I think that also helps with that. You're, you may see more balls put in play. It does, particularly in conjunction with a strike zone expansion. Yeah, and and yep. I think we need to look at the mound height again. They I think are looking seen a lot, early, I, I think that the uh, – since that change was made following the 68 um, season of the year of the pitcher, look at what, how many pitchers have been spending time on the DL compared to before. Yep. I mean, certainly they're not pitching as many innings, but part of it, too, is the angle that they're, that they're pitching at. Right. Yep, right. That has a little bit more wear and tear on arms. So you're not um, – you, you, I, I think you need to, to sit back and take a look and get some of, the, some of the best minds, get some of the former players involved, too. You know what was the, what made the game better in in the in the sixties and seventies when they played in the eighties? You know what was it? I mean, one of the things that I know that that I loved, particularly in the early eighties, was the whole speed aspect of the game. Yeah. You know those those Houston Astros teams. They were they may not have won at all, but they were competitive and they were fun as hell to watch. I mean, you, you had players with gap power that you were and you had the running games going. That was a, that was some pretty exciting t- baseball to watch. 
was. Yeah, I agree with you. And I also think if, if you're a cheap team, you pay a lot less for speed than you do for muscle. Yeah, it's a way to compete. Right. So that, yep. that would, I've always contended that would be an interesting angle for the Pirates to go after. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. You're right, those, those right. Astro teams uh, in the way 80s certainly were that. But that, and that's also a way to, to help their crisis of recruiting the best athletes, too. It would. Yeah, you've lost a whole generation of Af- uh, inner-city African-American kids who are not playing baseball. Yeah. They're going to other sports. Yeah. It would do some denting to it, that's for sure. Well, Two other things can I, I add when you guys are done, and one I forgot, and I think Dave, you it, 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 it makes it exciting. I mean, tell me that the game and uh, – you know, home runs are great. Love them. Don't get me wrong. I thought the game, um, I'll, I'll even do some blasphemy here and say the game on artificial turf. Um, I thought that was the most exciting yep. baseball in my lifetime was seeing the speed, the defense. Um, right. Yep. You know, the gap power. Um, yep. That's exciting stuff. Stolen base is exciting. It, was a much it, it really is. I mean, uh, when, when you saw some of the great – Base stealers of that of that era, it was you paid attention mm-hmm. when they got on base. It was like, okay, something's going to happen. Even if he didn't steal a base, he may pressure the pitcher into making a bad pitch, or maybe that one throw over the first was one throw too many. You know, there's a lot of different mm-hmm. things that that could be really disruptive in the game. Yep. Plus, you're playing. You, you, it, it's a first. It becomes a first to third game, like like it's like you know that that's that's where really. And you have a lot of those teams that they had the bigger ballparks and they had to have those outfielders who could carry, who could range a long way. You know, that one thing I will say about the Pirates ballpark, it is an exciting ballpark in how it's designed. I mean, you have that big left field. You have that little notch in there uh, that, that provides some difficulty. You, you have the short porch and right, so you, if you've got some lefties with some pop, that's pretty tempting. And... Um, it, it, they they keep the, the the lawn mowed fairly tight, so it it, it benefits the teams with a little bit of speed. So I mean, it's really well suited and a great place to watch ball games because it has a lot of this, the charms of the older parts, but it also has some things that you have to employ some strategy with. You know, the the bad thing about some of those artificial turf parks, they were they were so cookie cutter, they didn't have any personality. But if you can get a ball to to get on that, get in the gap and roll to the wall, you know, start the runners, baby, because they're going. Yeah, I, 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 to me, that's if I don't want to spend a lot of money, that's where I'm going for offensively. You, you can manufacture runs that way, uh, you know, just as easy as you can the home run, the the single home run, of course, because the other three guys have struck out in the inning. Um. But um, I, that, those are some great things. And, and your point on, on the um, automated strike zone, that would be the best way to increase offense because, you know what, if you're consistently knowing what the strike zone is, you don't have to adjust every game, and that's going to yeah. make for better offense just there. Got to be happy. Yeah. That's right. That's right. You think you can – I think – I'm going to make the bold claim you can have a 400 hitter if you automated a strike zone. Well, you know what? I mean, think about it. Today's hitters, bigger, stronger. They have that off-season training regimen. Um, yeah, why not? I mean, this particularly if you, if you do some of those pitching changes, too, because, you know, you, you've got those guys who, who are all out throwing 100 miles an hour filthy stuff for one inning or so, or maybe even two batters. Yeah. You know, you, you – Ease up on that a little bit, and you're gonna you're gonna get some more offense. But you know, that's why I like this three batter rule. I didn't think I was like you, Dave, when I first heard about it. I was like, come on, this is, this is gimmicky. But if you really think it through, and how it can affect the game in so many areas, um, I'm actually for it. It would be I mean, interesting. I don't, I'm not I'm not bothered by it either. I, I I think that you know, with with these guys bragging about how much genius they are in their Harvard spreadsheets. You just got to prepare for it. Sorry. But, so but I tell you what, the other thing you would do, here. it would put a, it would put a premium on switch hitters. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. Yep. I have a I'm couple other thoughts just to add, Dave. 
because I forgot them. Can I add them? Because a couple. Yeah, go please. I, the Fletch is right on. Starting to see, and we're starting to see on the streaming services. You know the, you know the part about the ad revenue, Fletch. The p- thought I have is this though. I guarantee you, Budweiser, any financial service company, car companies, insurance companies, they're going to want to advertise during baseball. So instead of a minute and a half or two minutes or whatever it is, you say, look, you got a minute. Oh, my God, you're cutting off my – too bad. Scarcity breeds more value. They bitch in the beginning. Some of them might pull away. Too bad. Somebody else took it. If you're Geico versus State Farm, you lost it. I guarantee they come back the next year to negotiate. The price is going to go back up. Again, Manfred and the baseball leadership should take control of that and the network executives. You cut it down, even if it's that half TV thing, that price isn't going to fall that far. And you're going to you're going to be you're going to be killing your top opponent to get a piece of that pie. Ultimately, yeah. one, two. Another thing is, and I, Dave, I talked about this with you, and I forgot to add it today. So let me throw this in. This replay stuff is ridiculous. You know, I'm sorry, no re, no replay challenges before the first inning. This nonsense from these self-important now, managers Gary, and GMs. There today. is going to be no replay before the first inning. You meant the seventh. I said I, I I meant no replay challenge or no no use of replay before the first inning. I, there there, there is no any. replay before the first inning. <laughs> is that what I said? <laughs> Friday, that, that is some preemptive replay. I've had too many. I've had too. Maybe I've had too. I'm going to anticipate this, Clint Hurdle. <laughs> <laughs> but my point is, is I'm sorry. Yeah. Most plays before the seventh inning right. usually aren't game changing. Postseason, I might be willing to listen a little bit more about that. But regular season, sorry. After the seventh inning, you get one challenge, that's it. And no looking at this camera and the replay to decide what you're going to do. Sorry. I mean, that stuff, and it's made the umpires tender. They don't make the calls on the fly anymore. Sometimes they don't make any call. I mean, that's added. Look how much that's added. I mean, sometimes there's four and five replays in a game. It's taking them five minutes to decide, right? There's 20 minutes. Yeah. I mean, it's just ridiculous. I mean, there's there's got to be some room for human error. But I don't think we're ever going to see umpires go away and they go to automated. I'd be using the automated for evaluation. And I don't care how good of an umpire somebody is or how much the players like them or the owners like them. If you strike zones the size of a postcard, we're giving you some time to correct it. If you don't do it, I'm sorry, you're, you're not going to get renewed. You know, it's that simple. I mean, I don't think they're ever going to go away from the human guy doing it. But it's time to stop, honestly – excuse it on this, kissing their ass. That's the strike zone. You're hired to do it. I don't care about your artistic, you know, uh, you know, your artistic, uh, you know, uh, license here. That's the strike zone. We got you on record here. Look, you know, 50% of the pitches, you're not calling strikes. Keep doing it. I'm sorry. You know, your contract's not going to get renewed, period. And I think that, to me, is one of the biggest things because, you know, when you start combining with some of this other stuff they're talking about, a pitch clock and getting in and out of the box and and then, you know, also the, the stuff that you guys are talking about, I really think it would speed up the game quite a bit and I think it would cause quite a bit of a different game. You know, when that yeah. ball is coming at you more rapidly, you don't got time to stand in there and wait for the perfect one. And, right. you know, particularly you're going to have to start swinging more. And, you know, if you're swinging more, you're not going to hit the ball out of the park. You're not just going to be standing around all the time. Sometimes the ball is going to bloop in. It's going to go down the line. You're going to get behind it. It'll look a little bit more like the game did years ago. I'm not sure the mentality with all this number crunching is going to go back to the speed. I agree. I think, you know, Tampa really wasn't speedy last year. But, you know, they did have pretty good up-the-middle defense, underrated. And their pitching, whether you like the opener or not, was better than people thought. Um, right. I think you're right. These teams that don't have any money or don't have the same level of money, that's a good way to compete. And you can compete on grass or turf that way. Right. So, um you know, hopefully we'll see more of it. But but the, the replay is another one. I've just I've just had it with the delays associated with that, and it, it, it it's ridiculous. I mean, some of these guys are contesting a close play at first base and a nothing nothing game in the second inning. That really doesn't change the game that much. And if it does, you're not that good anyway. So I mean, but 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 it's all again every everything's so critical. It's got to be right. You know, seventh inning World Series, yeah, it's got to be right. Game one of the World Series has probably got to be right. Uh, you know, eight games into the season in April, what's the co- what's the contest about? You know, right. I made a mistake. Play on. So, um, but you know, again, not discussed at all. Manfred hasn't discussed that issue at all. Uh, when we didn't have replay in 1976, were games going this slow? 
Yeah. So, I mean, the, the key stuff that's out there, I think you're right, Dave, it's always cosmetic and it's always non-confrontational. And they're going to have a big confrontation anyway. So if the Players Association wants to make hell over this, well, that's fine. Just get the guns a little more cleaned up then, you know, because yeah. you're, you're taking these. If, if you give them a floor salary cap, you'll be amazed the things that will will uh, be uh, conceded by the Players Union. Well, can I diverge for a second? I, I'm curious, and I know, Dave, we got the other stuff we always do, but do you really think it's that offensive that some organizations have said, there's no way I'm paying some guy $35 million. It doesn't guarantee me winning anything. I mean, do you think that's that offensive? That's, that's, These guys have finally the pushed the dollars. The, offense, to the, the, offense, point. the offensive part is a, a nutting seeing some opportunities to improve his team for one or two years at five and ten million, which you have this opportunity this free agent season. Yep. And he's not doing it. That's and he bad. cuts salary. He cuts That's salary. Bad. He has a chance to compete for a playoff. He has a tremendous pitching staff. The best pitching staff, uh, starters to relievers that this organization has had in two or three decades. Mm -hmm. And you're going to blow it because. What was you 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 are anticipating arbitration payings next year? Well, or you're concerned guys are about signing for one and two years at five million a year that last year would have cost ten to fifteen million. That that you're most concerned what, about your return on equity more than you are about you, you talk a bunch of nonsense to the media and the fans, but what you're concerned about is your eight point two percent return on equity. Well, that's what you're concerned with, and and that's to me, the players are upset at this free agent thing. You put a you put a floor on a salary cap, and all of a sudden a lot of these free agents are being signed, and teams are getting better. Agreed. And you're not trading Cleveland for a second team uh, utility man, or a um, uh, or a prospect who I think will be good down the road, but isn't ready at this point. You know that. that it, listen, guys. What, logically, it doesn't make sense to have a ceiling without a floor. In anything. In anything, in, in anything you're doing, if you want to be part of this league, there shouldn't be certain minimum requirements. Yep. Well, Whether that's it's what I mean. ballpark size, market size, whatever that is, but one of them should be payroll. Yeah. If I said ceiling, I didn't mean that. I meant floor. I, I'm, well, you I'm did. Talking about I did. But, I mean, you yeah, need to have both. You floor, Dave. I think. Well, you do, you, you do have the ceiling. I, I, I agree with and you. And the ceiling is, is, is in the, the form of the luxury tax, okay? I mean, yeah. it doesn't – but it, it's the same token, I mean – it's not uh, – there. the other part of it, too, it, it comes down to – we've talked about this before. It, it comes down to, to the broadcast. I mean, you look yeah. at the, the cable contract that the Yankees have versus the cable contract that the Pirates have. I mean, it's there's so much money that's going into it that, that's such a discrepancy. It's like they're playing two different sports. I mean, one, one thing that Pete Rizal did that was genius was, you know, it became almost like – it was a socialism sport. All yep. the teams benefited. It made them great. Yeah, a little bit you now. are correct. You chill a little bit now. That's right. That's right. And, and that would that would be great too. But you gotta you gotta tell these guys. I mean, over a third of the league now is throwing it in. A third of the teams are throwing it in before it starts, so they can do a rebuild. You either say well, listen, the other know, part of it though is that, that a lot of these teams are turning a profit before the opening day with all the different are. contracts that are out there in, in the streaming and everything. So. You know, for the Nuttings, I get it. They're in it for a business. They want to make money if they if they can get a couple of windows where they can try to win and get and keep fans coming by doing that. Then they're going to do that until something changes. There's no reason for them to to revise their their business there thing. I mean, they they've been able to do a lot of nice uh, additions at Seven Springs. That you know, even though they say it's not been funded by the Pirates, we all know that that's a horse shit. Hey, they, um, got, they got a top quality shag rug. In every room right now. Uh, have you have you seen their spa out there? It's unbelievable. They they put in a they put in a shooting range. They hired the guy away from Nemecole to do this. You know? Oh man, I, it just but, it, it just I I I mean I'm under the thing. You you put a floor in and tell these guys you want to play the game. This is this is what you got to do. Well, that's what the NBA bad, does. That's what the NBA bad does. for baseball to have a third of the put teams out of it at the beginning. But I gotta tell you guys, there's one thing I think about this that is somewhat of a positive, and I'm, I'm telling you, think about it. Forgetting about the, the the some teams tanking, and I agree there should be the floor. But 
think about it. Houston cut the thing to 100 losses three years in a row, and they drafted extremely well, okay? And they won a World Series, and they were damn competitive for one last year. Tampa and Oakland cut those payrolls ridiculous. Maybe it was egregious to the fans, and the return on equity shouldn't have been the primary focus, but they cut those payrolls, and they both won 90 games. I think some franchises have finally just said, this is ridiculous to be throwing $35 million dollars on one player. In fact, the player hit 247, I think. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think, that's, I think they've pushed this now finally to the point that some of these franchises are saying, that ain't going to guarantee us any wins. Let's do some of the things that we've asked for, which is put some money into the future and stuff like that. Now, it doesn't sound like Nutting's that kind of guy, but it does look like some of these organizations are thinking that way. The Braves' success last year, again, almost went back to the Shearholtz days. Nobody knew who Mike fulton Evich or any of these guys were. And look how they played. I think some of these franchises have just said, I'm done with this. I mean, well, I, A-Rod, they did, but for, for every Braves franchise you get, um, you're going to end up with a San Diego, and you're going to uh, yep. end up with four or five teams more like San Diego than like, uh, uh, than like the A's or Tampa Bay. Your solution forces that kind of ownership group out. Yeah. You've got to have a certain amount of money, and you've got to spend a certain amount. That forces and I'm not even talking free agents. Sign your goddamn uh, – oh, pardon my language – but sign your, your blessed uh, uh, players that you think can take you to the next level who you already own instead of giving them up after six years. That's yep. what I want to see. Yep. You know, yep. I don't want to see – you know, as much of a bonehead as Marte has been, I don't want to see him going just as he's starting to be the kind of player Mm -hmm. you you hoped he would. Yep. Cleveland's motto in the 90s. Yeah, right. Right. But, I mean, I just think some people have said, you know, again, the media, I'm not sure. Harper's Harper's an exciting player. He was a good gamer. Yeah. I'm not sure. you, You put him versus the 70s and the 80s, some of the baseball we saw. He's a good player. I'm not sure he's at the top of that. I don't think Machado is at all. I mean, honestly. I mean, he's had a couple years. He hit 259. Yeah. You know? So, I mean, I think I'm not sure that these guys are worth this kind of money. And I think there is clearly an ethics issue with a San Diego or perhaps even a Pittsburgh or just a lack of wallets. But there's yeah. a bunch of other organizations I think are saying this is this is nonsense. I'm not going to do this. You know, the Cardinals are never bidding for these people. Do you notice? There's no reason for that. But there's also, you know, no reason not to try to improve your club if you can. That is the, that is the point that you make about, to me, a strong argument. The union never talks about it. The players' union's still stupid. They keep yeah. carpet about how, oh, this is awful. You know, the Harper did all this, and now nobody wants them. They should be talking just like they should have been talking during the strikes of the '90s about the good veteran who now isn't getting a job because of somebody like Nutting's moves or Sandy. Right. They should be worried about that guy, not somebody right. like Harper who eventually is going to get some big money somewhere. Maybe it isn't quite the biggest number he thought. No, he's going to get 27 or 28 million. He's just not going to get 10 right. years. I don't know. I mean, even Kershaw, as good as he's been, lopping $25 million or whatever on one pitcher, you've got to be kidding me. I mean, that Dodger team would still be competitive without him. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't understand. I think they finally have pushed this to the point in these annual amounts and these long-term deals in baseball where some owners are just saying, I'm not, I'm not doing it anymore. You know, yeah. and, and if you're not doing it and you don't care about competing, and all you want to do is increase your return on equity. That's a problem, and that could be regulated by the owners together and the commissioner's office and the players even. Players should push for the, the, the minimum. Yeah. But um, the, the way it stands now, I think they've pushed it to the point that some of these guys are going to have a hard time getting placed anywhere. I really do. I mean, that's, that's a huge investment, $35 million. I mean, so you know, that, think of how much that takes, how much advertising and everything else to cover. So, yeah. I mean, I'm not as I'm not as busted up by it. I don't think it's so awful. There's there's always a price if you're trying to sell a house. There's a price you're going to push it to that nobody's going to buy it. Right. And it's the same thing with this. So I mean, you know, it's a shame that these two guys might be kind of sacrificial here. But I, I honestly, I'm not really surprised when you started seeing the numbers that some of these guys were commanding. And honestly, I'm not sure they're all-time greats or not. Not just these two. Some of these other guys with the money they're getting. So I think we're at that. I think we've reached a point, too. I just do. That we have. That we have. I mean, it should be interesting going forward. But, 
you know, we'll, we'll, we'll move on to our big moments. Fletch, I know you're, you're, uh, you, you have a little heart tug uh, that uh, Rooney is going down to meet with Antonio Brown. What <laughs> uh, do you well, have? Uh, <laughs> is I'm that your big moment that of the week? Antonio Brown was gracious enough to, to agree to meet with him. That's, that shows a lot of class. <laughs> will, will he be wearing the goat rings? Yes, yes. Do you remember what goat meant when we were growing up? I don't know. What a goat of game? You didn't want to be the goat. You didn't want to be the goat. Now it's considered an honor. You know, pretty so, pretty soon next thing, horse collar is going to mean, uh, you know, the the king of the the sport at that point. Yeah. You didn't want to wear the horse collar in the day. You did not. <laughs> oh man. Maybe What's busher will be a good thing. Much? Maybe busher will become a good thing then. Who knows? Busher, which is on, you know, I I and it's going to be. Uh, uh, fully uh, talked about in my big moment of the week, but I was uh, looking at the, my Three River Stadium yearbook from the year it opened, and Busher is on the back of it. I don't know if you remember the back of that yearbook. Oh, I do, and they gave you the other the other terms. That's how you learned what the horse collar was. It was someone was wearing the collar. And, and Busher is on that. Bush League is on it, but Bush League Busher, but that is in the bottom right hand corner. Yes, yes, indeed. Interesting. Oh, man. So, Dave, you're a Sabre member, are you not? I am. And I don't know whether you saw the announcement of the 2019 Henry Chadwick Award recipients. Uh, but, 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 Tenier. But uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a little shout-out to uh, a friend of mine's father. When I, when I lived oh, in... Yeah. Uh, when I lived in Los Angeles, uh, I was a coworker with this guy, and his dad, I found out, was, was a pioneer in baseball. Alan Roth was the first statistician to be employed full-time by a major league team. Uh, he went, it was in 1947, and he uh, went to, to Branch Rickey, and he pitched him the idea that, you know, you should understand situational statistics, like yeah. home versus road. Day versus night, left-handed, right-handed, you know, all that stuff, and that would help them win games. And you know, Roth's big thing is that RBIs were deceptive. So he was the first sabermetrician of all time, and he was taking those bits of sports and and, and baseball conventional wisdom, and he and he began asking them, people, you know, is this really right? Does this mean anything? Um, he wrote a column for the Sporting News for many years, and if you watch some of those old baseball. Uh, uh, rebroadcast from the 60s and 70s. Uh, he was a statistician working with Kirk Gowdy. So uh, Alan Roth, uh, born 1917, died 1992. Uh, his son, uh, Michael Roth, a good friend. And Alan Roth, this week, was recognized with the Henry Chadwick Award. That's my move. That's good. I did think of you when I saw that. Do you still have that stuff he had given you way back when for uh, oh, research? Oh, I had... Yeah, I, I had tons of, of game day um, media notes from, like, the early 70s that uh, apparently Mr. Roth was also a bit of a hoarder. So I have files and files of, of, of stuff that, uh, that were passed on to me when I was looking at doing some of those early books. So, yeah, tremendous, tremendous thing. So he started with Brooklyn Fletch and then moved to Los Angeles with the Dodgers? He did. He did. He was, he was the first one. He approached Branch Rickey with this idea. Yeah, interesting. And given the day game where it is today historically, that's a good move by Saber because obviously he was one of the founders of thinking about that stuff. Oh yeah, indeed. No, absolutely. Well deserved. Right. I remember when you just the look on your face when you got that uh, uh, had that package of stats. I mean, that that's pretty incredible. Yeah, that is interesting. Stuff. And the other thing that he had he he had this great collection of, of particularly um, Negro League magazines too. That it was, I think it was called Our Sports. I believe it was called, but they would. They were running uh, a lot of articles on Jackie Robinson and and breaking into the game. Because keep in mind that Alan Roth started the same year that Jackie Robinson did. I was going to say, it's the same kind of era. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So they, they, actually, they were actually quite close friends. And Robinson's an L.A. guy too, so, right, UCLA. So, uh, yeah. Oh, and, and I want one other thing too to, to yeah. talk about for this my, my moment. And, and I, I think we all want to – take a moment to remember the late, great Frank Robinson. Yep. 
a man who, despite his greatness, uh, seems to be underappreciated for what a, a ball player he was. Uh, 580, 586 homers, uh, MVP both leagues, just just an incredible ball player and an even better person. I mean, he took the mantle from and, and really went from what Jackie Robinson was doing. He brought it to management. Uh, he was the first African-American manager in, in baseball. Uh, player manager, too, which was kind of cool to see that sort of a throwback. Yep. But uh, completely underappreciated for what kind of player he was. And I think a lot of it was because he's one, to me, besides Fred McGriff, he is one of the other casualties of the steroids era, that people don't remember how great he was. Absolutely, absolutely, and and you know, uh, a negative on uh, sabermetric people. Um, you know, a complete busher to Bill James and his tweet uh, the day Robinson died. Uh, to oh, I missed that. All that Earl Wilson had a higher WAR than Frank Robinson. Are you kidding me? Who did? Uh, Bill James is just an—he's an ass. Right, who who did he compare the two? He, he basically came out just just to mention Earl Wilson had a higher WAR in '66 than Frank Robinson does. Who the hell cares? Yeah, what the hell was that? So come yeah. on, not on I this mean, yeah, And I'm, I'm Earl Wilson was 18 and 12 that year. Earl Wilson was not an MVP. MVP is most valuable player. I could give a rat's ass what WAR you had or what other you know saber stats you're going to hold up there. 18 and 12 pitcher is not a, with an over three ARA is not a, uh, an MVP. Robinson was wow. a weird player when he was a 42 year old. I mean, yeah. I mean, just, James should just shut up sometimes, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. He's, He's my busher of the week now. He, he is maybe busher of the month. Just shut up. Like I always oh, say, oh man, shut up. So. Uh, Gary. I mean, are you, you guys tell are going somebody to else to shut up this of, of of uh, of uh, having a man crush. But my moment of the week is Monday night in Philadelphia, Wednesday night in Pittsburgh. Number 87 was the best player on the ice against the most sizzling team in the league. Maybe Murray was better, but he was the best player on the ice, always in the right spot, got his line mates chances, shut down Drew when he went to get him, took Couturier completely out of the game here in Philadelphia. Wednesday night he comes back, who everybody thinks is the greatest player in the league right now. Most exciting, yes. Greatest, no chance. Outplayed both of those centers, groups of centers, in two wins at a time where his team was reeling. I'm sorry. Nobody's in the class of this guy at this particular And you know what the stupid news said the day after the uh, uh, Oiler game? No. That Crosby only had an assist. Watch the damn Uh game. Watched Watch the damn game, wow. and all the draws. When all the draws, McDavid was really not that much of a factor other than that ridiculous penalty, call, penalty shot call. Um, right. Crosby had a lot to do with that. Crosby's out there most of the time against McDavid that game. They had Cullen out there sometimes. But he outplayed McDavid, and his lines outplayed McDavid's lines. So the media doesn't know what it's talking about. Statistics aren't everything. Crosby controls the game every time he's out there, and he did it, he did it at a time when the team was really bumpy. Still a little bit bumpy. I mean, if Murray doesn't make those saves, they, they lose that game big. So Murray right. deserves some, quite a bit of credit, too, for how well he's played. But there's nobody better down the center of the ice than number 87. So, I mean, again, to me, that's got to be the moment of the week. Not really talked about that much, but it should be. Yeah, yeah? It should be. So, um, you know, that's my view. Well, my moment, gentlemen. Um, we, we talk about... Uh, the, the Three River Stadium may have been a cookie-cutter stadium, but what a stadium is remembered for is, is the memories that it gave inside, and to me there is no stadium better than Three River Stadium for what it gave us. And I am happy to announce that uh, the History Press has uh, uh, okayed the association of uh, gentlemen Pittsburgh journalists, of which we are uh, a proud part of. Uh, they gave a go-ahead for us to uh, write our next book about um, about such memories, a uh, year by year. Uh, Fletch, give the name, please. I think we're going to call it the Confluence of Champions. Yeah, that's good. That's good. That's good. Absolutely. Great. Great. Well, you have a journalism great. degree, Fletch. Yeah, it pays yeah. off here. It pays off here. 
Yeah, that and I can flip a mean burger. Those are those are the two skills I've got from that. <laughs> Nobody's better at that. But uh, I'm I'm real excited for this project because yeah. you you just look through the memories. I mean, Tom Rooney is going to give a firsthand account of just the clown organization that that uh, the Maulers were. Love the title he's picked. Yeah. Yep. One and dumb. Yeah, it's beautiful. Um, yep. You know, he, he is. I am so looking forward to that, and yep. and you know, we're going to have looks at uh, um, Roberto's. Uh, Bill Rainier is going to do a personal account of being at Roberto's three thousandth hit. Um, you know, Tom's going to look at uh, uh, the legend that the um, uh, immaculate reception has become, um, and and not just the play. I mean, it it there's a lot there. I mean. Uh, you know, Fletch, you you have seventy nine. I have uh, let's see, I have seventy one, and I have, uh, so 90, have seventy one. Yeah, ninety four is going to be interesting because I was covering the Pirates uh, when I was at Pittsburgh Magazine and covering the All Star Game in particular, and it was it was a very surreal thing because the strike everyone knew the strike was happening, and both uh, Selig and Donald Fear were, were there, and the reporters were going back and forth uh, covering them and hearing what they had to say. But probably my, my favorite memory of that All-Star game was I was sitting in the, the National League locker room, and I was talking to Tony Gwynn, and he, he looks over the corner of his eye, and his son, Chris, is you know, he's just a young kid at that time, probably about six, five, six years old, and he's running around and around, and Tony looks at me and says, excuse me for one second. And he, he looks over to his son and says, you are in the locker room of the All-Star game. You need to show some respect and sit down. And that was it. Kid just sat down. And, we, and then, he, then Tony looked at me and he says, I'm sorry about that. What were we talking about? <laughs> oh, man. That's awesome. That's, That's awesome. That is going to be a hell of an article. Um, you know, Gary, you're, you're going to get to write about that memorable uh, Bob Prince game in 85? 85, yep. Yep. Oh, man. I, I, I was at that game. Punishment. I watched a ton of games that year in '85, so I, I remember how bad they were. Luis De Leon, were. some others, um, record-wise, they were. Uh, yeah, that was certainly certainly a highlight at the stadium. I, I, yeah. I just, I mean, we're going to take it year by year. We're going to do some special things. Um, Duquesne even won. Uh, Bob Healy is going to write about uh, Duquesne's first football national championship. The little-known club football national championship, which Duquesne won at Three River Stadium in 1973. Interesting. Wow. Didn't know that. So, um, you know, Latch is going to talk about, you, you recall, uh, I'm sure, when Pitt Penn State was an annual Three Rivers uh, uh, tradition for a three-, four-year period. Uh, one of them being uh, in 1976 when Pitt clinched its uh, national championship. Um, for all intents and purposes, against Penn State. So, um, I just I, I have so many great memories in this place. I'm just so pumped to be able to uh, uh, team up with you guys and, and the rest of the association and uh, and write about uh, you know everybody has their stadium in their lifetime. This is ours. Yep. Yep. Is Latch back in Pittsburgh, Dave? Yes. Yeah. I didn't know that. Interesting. Yes, okay. he is. Yes, he is. That's good. But um, so we'll be looking at that now. Uh, Gary, you got a, you got a, a prediction for us? Yeah, it's, I'm weak, boy. I tell you, there's just not that much going on. I don't really have the stuff I know that much. Like the box, there's not that much boxing of any significance. And the one thing I was thinking about was the, the, the just joke that these All Star games have become, and the NBA All Star game. I mean, this is an era even if he could check their personalities, where there's a tremendous amount of players, you know, the Ante Kempo, Harden, even James, whether you like some of their personalities or not, there, there's just some tremendous talents, Westbrooks. But the game has just become a complete circus of more talking about the parties the night before and, you know, all this kind of stuff, celebrities sitting on the side. I just have a feeling my prediction is going to be that very few people are going to watch it. You know, it'll be 151, 147, and the ratings are going to continue to drop, just like they've done for the Super Bowl and some other stuff. So it's kind of a boring boring prediction, but I have a feeling, despite the fact that a lot of people are off the next day, I don't think it's going to get very good ratings at all. I really don't. Yeah. I just think it, 
it's just these games have become, even that hockey win, it's just a circus. To me, the three-on-three is a joke anyway, even in the overtime. You know, the league kisses the Red Wings' ass, and Ken Holland, when he had all those Russians, thought that was something they should do. They should junk that, in my view. Uh, yeah. I got other, there's other ways to decide an NHL game besides some kind of circus act. And that NBA game's become nothing but a circus act. And it's more about all the junk going on outside than it is the game. The games in the 70s, similar to baseball, were pretty competitive games when you had those ABA guys come in. And some well, you were proving something there, yeah. Yeah, there was proving something, and the conferences mattered a little bit more, too, than they do now, it seems. But I guess my prediction is that's going to continue to be a dud, no matter what silver in the NBA pump it up as, or Rachel Nichols yeah. in the NBA, you know, the jump do. It's, it's just nobody cares. So, my so your, prediction, your, your prediction there is you're not going to watch it. I'm not really going to watch it. I don't love the NBA anyway anymore. I think the playoffs, I have a tendency to tune in. But I also think that that game in particular has just become – an absolute circus. Yeah. And I, they are, as you said, they all have. They all have. Yep. Yep. But, uh, Mr. Fletch. Before I give my uh, thought, I'm going to ask you guys this trivia question. Okay. And this is kind of weird when I mean, you think about it. Who was the first rock band to have a concert at Three River Stadium? Hmm. Donny Iris? 71. They would not be Donny Iris. I'm, I have uh, Fletch. I, I would I, Led Zeppelin. I, I have no idea. Well, Led Zeppelin uh, was in the third year of concerts. I would have thought they were first, probably around that time. The first concert the first would have year. been Three Three Dog Night. Well, but here's the no. thing that's weird about it: was the date of it, November thirteenth. How the hell do you have an outdoor oh. concert scheduled for November thirteenth? That's stunning. That is that is uh, an old-fashioned love song, my friend. <laughs> that is. That is one being the loneliest number because I'm not going there with too many people, I don't think. You're putting a lot of tarp over those stands to cover the empty seats. I actually hear, hear you know, at, at a, uh, a place in Greensburg in 1979, I was excited when I saw on the, on the screen that uh, – uh, I was going to be able to see uh, uh, Three Dog Night in the bar, only to find out that, of course, they had just bought the name, and there was nobody who was actually Three Dog Night. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I, it's tragic that I can't remember that bar's name, but on the other end, oh, it, was, wow. it was a low moment for me. I, I can understand. But I'm going to give you a high moment for my prediction. Please. How do you like that? There's a segue. How's that segue? Hey, segue. Mr. Segue hey, man. Hey, hey, plus segue. Um, <laughs> I think a lot, a lot of the Penguins' ills are going to be cured with the return of their long lost defenseman, Mr. Schultz. I think yeah. that some of the power play issues go away. I think that they're, it, it, that to me is like a deadline deal, getting him to come in. So I, I think we're going to see a lot of positives. And he's been cleared to play. He's off of IR, so it's just a matter of time before he's in. Uh, be good to have him back. Mover. He is a puck mover. Good he to have really back. help, my friend. I agree. I agree. Well, mine, my prediction is Jeff Capel is now doing what Pitt thought he could. I'm not talking about this team this year, which went over the expectations, but they're they're running out of gas. They have no big man. Uh, short bench, predictable what's happening, but a good, a good year to start. But he is starting to bring in, uh, in the course of this week, he has begun his 2019-20 recruiting by bringing in two four-stars. I'm going to guarantee you and predict that I'm not going to be able to spell the or pronounce these names properly, but he's, bring, he's brought in a kid who is a center who's going to give them some, some size uh, named Karim Kulabali. Could be wrong with this, but I'm going with that uh, uh, that pronunciation. But this guy is a four-star by ESPN. He's six nine, but he has wingspan that'll make him play a lot bigger than that. Um, Two thirty-five, so he's going to have some meat on him. Yeah. Um, and uh, he is joining another Universal four-star. Going to botch this name up for you, but that's okay. We'll learn how to pronounce it next year. Gerald Drumguli who uh, they got earlier in the week. When was the last time Pitt has pulled in two four-stars in one week? I don't know that I remember them ever doing that. 
but maybe the Charles Smith team. Maybe the Charles Smith team was a good uh, name. Perhaps, that perhaps that. when yeah, Charles Smith and Curtis Aiken, I think, came in the. Same. Those two maybe, but that's it. Yeah, you're right, Dave. Yeah. yeah, but he's got he's got a couple other guys on his radar who I can't pronounce, but are four stars also, um, including a four uh, seven footer that'll be visiting uh, uh, the uh, Pete this weekend, and I just think if. He continues to go with the players he's rumored with. He has five scholarships in. You may be seeing the makings of a team that's better than anything uh, Jamie Dixon ever put out. Um, this guy is well worth the money. Yep. Well, here's what I'm going to do to you right now, Dave. I'm going to crush your Please. spirit. Please. Because you know what's going to happen? He is <laughs> gonna, He's going to build this team up. And it's going to be a great thing to see, and we're going to get so excited. And then Coach K is going to retire, and he's <sighs> that's oh. that's my that's my prediction to you, Dave. Oh, the nightmare scenario! It is the nightmare uh, scenario. How old? You better hope the coach the Coach K continues to love the game and doesn't get tired. Sometimes I wish the bastard would go away, but now I'm I'm hoping he stays till he's eighty. Absolutely. How old is he in the mid sixties. Seriously, Shashevsky mid seventy two. Sixty eight. How old is Shashevsky? Seventy two. He's that old. Oh boy. Jeez, I didn't know that. Seventy two years old. He's a young seventy two though. Yeah. A young. Dave, 72. it's gonna it, it's gonna happen. That's that's what's gonna happen. That is the well, nightmare scenario. But you know what? If and, you get a machine going, I mean, it can falter quickly, like Massimino let it falter here. But if you get a machine, well, maybe they'll going, finally hire a. Uh, 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 Sean Miller. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, sure, they could hire Sean Miller. They could hire Sean Miller in a second. Just keep know. him off the phone. <laughs> you know, keep him off the phone. <laughs> you know, I, I think that that could be out there. Lord knows uh, his days sound like they're numbered at uh, Arizona. <laughs> yep. Oh, man. But. All right, gentlemen, this has been a fun evening. It has been. And next week, pitchers and catchers will have reported. So we'll talk a little early baseball, and and uh, I just uh, actually got something across the wire that we are soon uh, to hear that Bryce has made a decision. Hmm. Interesting. So it is interesting. We will uh, probably within the next 24 hours, according to this MLB.com report, we will know where Bryce Harper is going. Well, yeah, I'm sure he'll look good in the pirate uniform. <laughs> He would. He would, but he's not going to look as good as uh, uh, Garth Brooks in a pirate uniform. Well, thankfully, he'll look better than Bartolo Colon in any uniform. So. <laughs> That's true. Oh, man. That is I'll true. tell you. Well, I'm going to make my prediction on Bryce Harper. Padres. There you go. It's funny how they're wow. a live dog in this stuff. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Of course, they, you know, wow. nobody else is making more than $1,000 a month, so, I mean. Oh, please. They'll sign him, agree to pay a third of his salary uh, at midseason just to get rid of him. That's what the Padres do. Yep, yep, yep. That's true. They could be doing it just to pick up prospects down the road when somebody's in the hunt and they'll take them. That could be. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. But All right, gentlemen, you have a fine evening. You too, Dave. Fletch. All right. Are we talk to you guys. The proceeding was a comfortably zoned radio network production. Thank you for listening.